Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another live edition of our program Gardens of the Pious Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa al-Aqibatu lil-Muttaqeen wa la'udwana illa ala al-Zalimeen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidi al-Awaleen wa al-Akhirin Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Today's episode my dear viewers is number 505 and uh, we'll continue with chapter number 234. That is going to be our 15th episode in the chapter of the obligation and the virtues of jihad. The first hadith in this chapter is hadith number, in this episode, is hadith number 1315. 1315. It's a sound hadith collected by Imam Muslim. And narrated by the great companion Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an. An Anas radiyallahu anhu qal, Intalaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama wa ashabuhu hatta sabaqu al-mushrikina ila badr. Wa jaa al-mushrikuna faqala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallama لا يقدمن أحد منكم إلى شيء حتى أكون أنا دونه فدن المشركون فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قوموا إلى جنة عرضها السماوات والأرض قال يقول عمير بن الحمام الأنصاري رضي الله عنه يا رسول الله جنة عرضها السماوات والأرض قال نعم قال بخ بخ فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما يحملك على قولك بخ بخ قال لا والله يا رسول الله إلا رجاء أن أكون من أهلها قال فإنك من أهلها فأخرج ثمرات من قرنه فجعل يأكل منهن ثم قال لئن أنا حييت حتى آكل تمراتي هذه إنها لحياة طويلة فرمى بما كان معه من التمر ثم قاتلهم حتى قتل As I said, this is a sound hadith collected by Imam Muslim narrated Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him one of the great companions of the Prophet Sallallahu he has served him for 10 years. Throughout his staying in Medina, he was assisting him and he was always with him. So he narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and his companions reached Badr before the Meccan pagans. And when they arrived, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered them, let no one of you advance ahead of me. When the Meccans, when Quraysh came near, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, now stand up and proceed towards Jannah, heavens, which is as wide as the heavens and the earth. So Umayr ibn al-Humam, may Allah be pleased with him, one of the companions, one of Al-Ansar, asked, Is Jannah as wide as the heavens and the earth? So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, answered in the affirmative. Umayr ibn al-Humam, may Allah be pleased with him, remarked, saying, Bakhin, Bakhin, you can express about it in English as when you say, 
Wow, great, great. So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, asked him, What had urged you to say so? So he answered, Oh, nothing, O Prophet of Allah, but I'm hoping that I might become one of the dwellers of paradise, which you described. So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Well, you will definitely be among them. Umayr ibn al-Humam then took some dates out of his quiver. And while he began to eat them, but after a short while, he said to himself, Well, if I last till I eat my dates, it will mean a long life. So he threw them away. And then uh, he threw the dates away. Then he fought against the enemies until he was martyred. The hadith is collected by Imam Muslim. So what do we have here, brothers and sisters? The Battle of Badr took place on the second year after the migration. And it was on the 17th of the blessed month of Ramadan, the month of victory. That was before prescribing fasting during the month of Ramadan. When the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrated to uh, Medina, he and all his companions were forced to leave everything behind. You can say their wealth, their homes, their properties, and their positions all were confiscated by the Meccan pagans. Not only that they were forced to leave, but they chased them, and whoever was captured would be killed. To the extent that they put a bounty on head of the Prophet ﷺ and his companion Abu Bakr Siddiq, a hundred camels each, whoever will capture them dead or alive, will get a hundred camel for each one of them. If you kill Muhammad or you capture him alive, you will get an award of a hundred camels. Likewise with Abu Bakr Siddiq. When uh, Suhaib al Rumi, may Allah be pleased with him, and who was a merchant, and he had some wealth, decided to escape from Mecca and migrate to Medina. The Meccan pagans chased them, and they said, when you arrive to Mecca, you're poor and broke, and now you just wanna leave like that? We're not gonna leave you to leave Mecca with all the wealth that you made in Mecca. What you made in Mecca must stay in Mecca. So I said, well, so if I give you all my money, would you let me go? They said yes, and why they had this bargain? Because Suhaib al-Rumi was a very clever archer. So he took some arrows out of his quiver, he put them in the bow, and he said, whoever will dare to come close, I'm gonna take as many of you down before you will get me. So they struck a deal, you give us the money, we'll let you go. So this is one example, and how Suhaib al-Rumi happily said, here's all my money, I hid it somewhere and he directed them and he collected all his wealth. And when he walked to Al Medina barefooted with no money whatsoever, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was who advanced before him, welcomed him saying, Rabi Hal Bayu Suhaib, successful indeed is your trade, Suhaib. He gave away and he sacrificed all his wealth, all his possessions for the sake of Allah for the sake of his faith and religion, to migrate from the home of disbelief, which was Mecca back then, to the home of Iman, to Darul Islam, to Darul Iman, to al Medina, the home of Hijrah. So this is an example, in addition to many other examples. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam decided, now it's time to recover some of our losses. There is a caravan that the Meccans invested plenty of wealth in it. As you know that the Meccans used to have two trips. Uh, one major trip, caravan or caravans will go to Asham normally in summer. And another one will go to Yemen normally in winter. Rihlat al shitai wa sayf The Almighty Allah referred to the two trips in Surah Quraysh. Li'ila fi Quraysh. Ila fihim rihlat al shitai wa sayf and the Almighty Allah granted, granted Quraysh security because people would honor them. They say they are the custodians of the Haram. 
the custodians of the Kaaba, so leave them alone. Even the highway robbers would leave them alone. But they turned to be worse than the highway robbers because they robbed their fellow citizens, they robbed their own relatives, they robbed all Muslims simply because of accepting faith and becoming Muslims. Not only that they forced them out of their homes, but they took their positions, their homes, their properties, and everything. So when the Prophet وسلم, decided to claim some of their losses from this caravan, he sent a person by the name Busaysa uh, ibn Amr ibn Thalaba to collect and gather some intelligent information. Where is the caravan exactly? And when will it pass by so that they can intercept it and collect some of their losses? The caravan was led by Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was a Meccan chieftain back then and he was a Kafir. So on the way back, Abu Sufyan heard that Muhammad had mobilized you know, a couple hundred of his companions because the Prophet Sallallahu once he heard the news that it is approaching, he said, whoever has a ready ride, jump on your ride and follow me. Some said, oh Prophet of Allah, you know, my ride is, uh, you know, um, a couple miles away or in here and there, I'm going to bring my ride. He said, no, only those who have their rides ready because you're not going to fight. It is not going to be a battle. It's not going to be a war. It is just to intercept the caravan. So only 314 of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ joined him. He said, He said, We're only after one thing, which is the caravan. So whoever has a ride already ready, jump on the back of your ride and join us. Which indicates that they never intended to fight. Abu Sufyan managed to change the route of the caravan and they reached safely and they were not touched the least but when Abu Sufyan on the way heard that Muhammad وسلم, mobilized his companions in order to intercept the caravan to collect some of their losses he sent asking for help from Mecca so Abu Jahl Al-Hakam Ibn Hisham Amr Ibn Hisham Abu Al-Hakam Amr Ibn Hisham whose title is Abu Jahl the father of ignorance decided to lead an army of 1,000 Meccans in order to come to where the Prophet ﷺ was camping Badr in order to fight with the intention of eliminating Islam and Muslims and killing Muhammad ﷺ and his companions. Abu Sufyan begged them, no need, we're safe, the caravan is safe. He said, no, we're going to reach Badr. We're going to encamp there for three days. We're going to drink wine. We're going to do the barbecue. And the belly dancers and the singers, everybody is going to dance and sing so that the whole peninsula would hear that we're here and no one can dare to intercept our caravan. So he came with arrogance. As they approached, Badr is 160 kilometers away from uh, Mecca, from Medina. So the Prophet وسلم, after consulting his companions, and hearing from Al-Muhajireen first, then hearing from Al-Ansar that they are very willing to fight those enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he gained their support. He camped at the water well of Badr. And then when the Meccans came and the war started, you know what happened on the battle of Badr? It only took uh, a matter of a couple hours and the Meccans were utterly defeated. And 70 of the chieftains of Mecca were killed, including those Meccan leaders who used to harm and hurt the Prophet and Muslims, including those whom the Prophet ﷺ invoked Allah against them. There were seven. There were seven whom the Prophet ﷺ was, when he was praying, they put the intestine and the leftover after, uh, of, of, uh, of a camel on top of his back. And no one dared to remove it except his little daughter Fatima came and removed it. Then after he finished the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ raised his hand and he started making dua against those Meccan chieftains one by one, seven people. And all those seven people were killed on the battle of Badr. On top of whom was Abu Jahl. Then the battle was over and the Prophet ﷺ declared victory 
and they took prisoners of war, 70 of the Meccans. And also they collected a lot of war spoils. While Muslims were only 314 and the Meccans were 950 to 1000. You all know the event of the Battle of Badr, which gave Muslims a beautiful, very positive repetition in the entire peninsula. So Anas ibn Malik also narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, on that day that when the, when the Meccans or the Quraysh, the polytheists approach, no one should advance ahead of me. I should advance first. And then when you hear my command, you can advance after me. And right before battling and combating with the Meccans, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reminded the companions with the fate of those who die for the sake of Allah when he said Kumu ila wal-ard. you guys get up we're approaching heavens which is as huge as wide as the heavens and the earth and that is also stated in the Quran twice once in Surah Al-Imran and once in Surah Al-Hadid so we find in Surah Ali Imran, the Almighty Allah says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Be quick, you all together, towards forgiveness from your Lord, and Jannah, heaven, as wide as السماوات والأرض. All the heavens, all the earth, our worldly heavens, our worldly earth is nothing compared to Al-Jannah which Allah has prepared for Al-Muttaqeen. Also in Surah Al-Hadid, سَابِقُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا كَعَرْضِ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعِدَّتْ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ So Umayr ibn al-Humam, and Umayr ibn al-Humam one of the companions of Al-Ansar and he was one of the pioneers of Al-Ansar who accepted Islam even before meeting with Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. As you all know that when the first batch Sa'd ibn Ubadah and others uh, accepted Islam and Ubadah ibn Samit was among those who attended the pledge of Al-Aqaba then the Prophet ﷺ invoyed and delegated with them Mus'ab ibn Umayyah, the first ambassador in Islam. So he started giving da'wah. Among the very first people to accept Islam in Medina, the pioneers, was Umayyah ibn al-Humam, who is known as Al-Ansari, because he's from Al-Ansar. May Allah be pleased with him. So the Prophet ﷺ said one word, قُومُوا إِلَى جَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ get up and fight for the sake of Allah in order to gain heaven which is as wide as the heavens and the earth. So Umayr ibn al-Humam said, Ya Rasulullah, Jannatin arduha ka'ard al-samai wal-ard, arduha al-samawat wal-ard. Is it really that heaven as huge, as big, as wide as the heavens and the earth? He said, Naam, yes certainly. So he said, Bakhin, Bakhin. And the word Bakhin, Bakhin in Arabic is to express your amazement. Like saying, oh, great. Wow. Huge. So the Prophet Wasallam said, why are you saying so? He said, oh, nothing. But I hope to be among its dwellers. There the Prophet Wasallam assured him and he wouldn't assure him unless if he was informed by the Almighty Allah. And as you know, prior to the battle of Badr, when the Prophet ﷺ raised his hand and he started making dua, Abu Bakr said that you could see his underarm while he is making dua. And uh, his shawl or his, um, you know, rida fell off his shoulders. And Abu Bakr Siddiq was asking him to take it easy on himself. He says, don't worry. Allah will never let you down. Then the Messenger of Allah, Aghfa Aghfa'a, yani a lowest number of our token. He dozed off a little bit. Then he woke up and said, Abshir ya Abu Bakr, 
rejoice, O Abba Bakr. I could see Gabriel is leading troops of the angels. Do you see the clouds of dust? He's coming in the midst of that. So the Almighty Allah informed him. And then he said before the battle, Inni la ara masari al qawm. I was seen where such and such people will be killed and, uh, you know, and, and be humiliated. Then he pointed, Abu Jahl will die here, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, or this or that, and he pointed. And subhanAllah, they checked after the battle to find wherever the Prophet ﷺ said, they found those whom the Prophet ﷺ gave them the glad tidings. Those are the heads, the leaders of disbelief and opposition of Islam were killed. So obviously, it is not really something far away that the Almighty Allah revealed to him that this companion would be martyred and he would be a shaheed, a true shaheed. And that's why he said to Umayyad ibn al-Humam, Anta minhum, you will be among the inhabitants and the dwellers of paradise, which is as wide as the heavens and the earth. In the other hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لَمَوْضِعُ سَوْطِ أَحَدِكُمْ فِي الْجَنَّةِ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا So that means the small place which could be occupied barely by a stick or a whip that uh, people used to carry in the past, a small place like that is better than the whole world and what it contains. So what about heaven itself? جَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ in Surah Al Imran أُعِدَّتْ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ in Surah Al Hadi. So Umayr ibn al Humam, may Allah be pleased with him, um, when the combat started, he had some dates. You know, people back then, you know, wouldn't have much more than dates. So he took some dates out of his quiver and he was eating them. Dates are very nutritive. It's a food, it's a meal, it's not just a, um, you know, snacks or appetizers or dessert. So when he was eating, he just remembered that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, you'll be one of them. He said, wow, why shall I waste time? It's such a long life that I plan to live to finish eating those dates. So he threw them away and he launched into the battle and he fought against the enemies and he was martyred. This is the scenario of the hadith, brothers and sisters, which assures according to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that those who die for the sake of Allah, defending their faith, their honor, their belief, and their fellow believers, that they shall enter paradise as wide as the heavens and the earth. The following hadith is gonna be a long hadith. And it also has a very interesting story. So if we can at least manage to read it before the break, we'll do that insha'Allah. Hadith number 1316. An Anasin Radiallahu Anhu. Kal Ja فبعث إليهم سبعين رجلا من الأنصار يقال لهم القراء فيهم خالي حرام حرام ابن ملحان يقرؤون القرآن وتدارسون بالليل يتعلمون وكانوا بالنهار يجيئون بالماء فيضعونه في المسجد ويحتطبون فيبيعونه ويشترون به الطعام لأهل الصفة وللفقراء فبعثهم النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فعرضوا لهم فقتلوهم قبل أن يبلغوا المكان فقالوا اللهم بلغ عنا نبينا أنا قد لقيناك فرضينا عنك ورضيت عنا وأتى رجل حراما خال أنس من خلفه فطعنه برمح حتى أنفذه فقال حرام فزت ورب الكعبة فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن إخوانكم قد قتلوا وإنهم قالوا 
اللهم بلغ عنا نبينا أنا قد لقيناك فرضينا عنك ورضيت عنا The hadith is agreed upon its authenticity and this narration which I just quoted is collected by Imam Bukhari. May Allah have mercy on him. So as I said, this hadith is agreed upon its authenticity. But the previous narration that I quoted is collected by Imam Muslim. The text is collected by Imam Muslim. The one which is collected by Imam Bukhari is pretty much the same with a very slight difference. So the meaning of this uh, interesting hadith is as follows. Anas ibn Malik, who is also the narrator of the previous hadith, narrated that some people came to the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, and said, would you please send with us some of your men in order to teach us the Quran and Sunnah? So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, sent with them 70 men from Al Ansar. They were known as Al Qurra, yani the reciters of the Quran. And among them was my maternal uncle, Haram. So they used to recite the Quran, ponder over its meaning, and learn its wisdom at night. And during the day, they used to fetch water and pour it in pitchers in the masjid. And then they would collect fire logs, wood, and sell it. And with its price, they would buy food for the poor people and particularly the people of as -Suffa. So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, sent those 70 Qurra or reciters with those people. But... Unfortunately, those people were treacherous. They betrayed. So they fell upon them and they killed them before they reached their destination. And while those companions were dying, they invoked Allah. O oh Allah, convey from us the news to our Prophet, peace be upon him, that we have met you in a way that we are so pleased with you and you too are pleased with us. So the narrator Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu an said, and a man attacked my uncle, my maternal uncle Haram from behind, and he smote him with a spear which pierced him. Whereupon Haram said, by the Lord of the Kaaba, I have met with success. Fuzdu wa Rabbi al-Kaaba, by the Lord of the Kaaba, I am a winner, I'm a successful person, I won. So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said to his companions, Will your brothers have been slain? And they were saying, Oh Allah, convey from us to your Messenger, peace be upon him, that we have met you and we are pleased with you and you are pleased with us. This is the hadith, brothers and sisters, both the Arabic text and the rough English meaning and with a promise, insha'Allah, after we take a short break, we will shed some light on the meaning of this beautiful hadith. Stay tuned. We'll be back, insha'Allah, in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Our phone numbers as they should appear on the bottom of the screen beginning with the record are 002 then 023855132. Alternatively I record 002 then 01005469323. WhatsApp numbers, area code 001-347-80625. And finally, area code 001-361-489-1503. And the Facebook page or live on both the Facebook and the uh, YouTube channel. M. Salah Official and M. Salah on the YouTube channel. Um, no need to remind you to share what you like and also to subscribe to the YouTube channel. I appreciate that. The hadith which we studied or at least got to read 
both Arabic and English uh, rough meaning uh, before uh, the break is a very interesting hadith. And uh, it's very hard to take it out of context and just to focus on the text itself without knowing the circumstances. What is the, the, the story behind that? In brief, before the break we spoke about the grand victory on the Battle of Badr while Muslims were less than one third of the Meccan army and they only had two horses and they were not even ready to fight. The Meccans were well prepared and they had all the means, all the arms, but they were utterly defeated simply because it's not a matter of quantity or power or strength. It's a matter of in أَقْدَامَكُمْ You will be eligible for victory if, if Allah is on your side. But if you and your enemies are the same, يعني, you both drink, you both dance, you both commit adultery, you both fight the dua of Allah, you both suppress those who are devout worshippers, then guess what? Don't even dream of gaining victory. This is what is happening to all the Muslim Ummah now. All the Muslim Ummah now. You do not find anywhere Muslims in their Muslim societies who can freely worship Allah and learn the deen and practice without opposition, without hindrances. You know? So that's why whenever we happen to have a fight with any enemies, I'm talking about the past few decades. Why do we keep losing? You know, you keep saying Allahu Akbar and we're Muslims, but you're not actually practicing Islam. So after the battle of Badr and the Meccans decided to take revenge, so this time they came, they marched forth from Mecca with an army of 3,000. And now this time they were well prepared, really ready. You remember the caravan which was saved? They did not spend a penny out of it. All the money which was earned out of selling the goods was invested in, invested in building up this army which will now take revenge and avenge the death of 70 Meccans and the humiliation. So they built up a very strong army to the extent that Abu Sufyan, who was the commander of this army, led the army and they took women, they took wealth, gold and silver with them in order to encourage their own men to fight, either to gain victory or to die. Because, you know, you have your women with you, you have your wealth with you. There is no going back. You either gain victory or you die. And again, the Muslim army uh, on that battle, because they were not prepared, they were surprised with the attack. They were only 700. But subhanallah, the Prophet ﷺ drew the plan and assigned archers here and there. And uh, in a matter of a couple hours, the Meccan army was utterly defeated and they ran off. So Muslims started collecting the spoils. And when the archers descended from the Mount of the Archers and they disobeyed the command of the Messenger of Allah, which literally means they disobeyed Allah the Almighty, they lost. And it was a big dilemma. And 70 of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ was martyred, including Mus'ab ibn Umayr and Hamza, the Prophet's uncle, Asadullah, Sayyid al-Shuhada, the master of the martyrs, etc. And also as victory on the battle of Badr brought about huge impact and positive feedback for the Muslim Ummah, the defeat on the battle of Uhud brought a very negative impact on the Muslim Ummah. So some people, a lot of Arab from the Arabic tribes, particularly from Najd, they plotted against Muslims. They wanted to hurt them because they thought that they cannot get us. They're very weak, they're very vulnerable. Look what happened to them on the battle of Uhud. So a group of people came to Medina. They visited with the Prophet ﷺ. They pretended that they are interested in Islam and they wanted them they wanted the Prophet ﷺ to envoy some of Muslims who are very well versed in the Qur'an in order to teach them the Qur'an and give da'wah 
to the people. That was the beginning of the story and to be continued after this call, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Maru from Gambia, assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, Akhi. Go ahead, I'm listening. Uh, I have a question. No. Um, my question, although it may be uh, a bit out of topic, but I'll just go on to it. Just allow me to uh, say it. Okay, um, the question is um, I am a teacher and uh, I teach subjects or courses like economics and uh, business management. And uh, one of the some some topics in it involve uh, interest and uh, these uh, banking aspects. Yeah. So you teach how uh, to acquire loans and how to invest in the uh, how to call it stock, stock exchange market and so on. So we and these things involve things that are uh, haram, like the interest aspect of securities, buying and selling of securities and so on. Yeah. So uh, my question there is then, if I am teaching this, uh, and then it's most likely that some might uh, engage in the acts, and then I believe uh, in this religion, and it, it, say, it is said that anyone who teaches something good, you get a reward for anyone that does it after you. And if you teach something bad also, you get the screen for anyone that does it. So I am teaching these uh, topics, although there are several other topics which are okay, but these ones involve interest and so on. So am I having anything if someone goes and acquires interest based on the knowledge he gets from my teaching? Of course you are, unless if you, while teaching that, you uh, make sure to alert the students that this is what is lawful and this is what is not lawful. So we're learning what is not lawful in order to avoid it. And I'm suggesting to you what is the right way to do it. But if you're instructing people as how to earn through interest, of course, every time one of your students uh, practices what you taught him or her, he's blameworthy, you're blameworthy too. فَدَّلُّوا عَلَى الشَّرِّ عَلَيْهِ وِزْرُوا فَاعِلِهِ As well, a person who guides people or misleads people to something evil shall earn a similar punishment for each and every person who will act upon his misguidance. So when you're, when you're teaching that and you make them aware that this is haram and this is forbidden and this is devastating and you should not be doing this kind of transaction, rather the halal way is one, two, three, and you explain that to them, that will do it, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Muhammad from New Zealand. Muhammad from New Zealand. Hello, Sheikh. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have two questions for you, Sheikh. Go ahead, please. Uh, the first question is that uh, there's something that I find a little bit confusing. I, I needed some clarification from you. Mm -hmm. This is uh, during the prayer when someone stands for prayer and then he starts and says, Allahu Akbar. Some people will start by saying, uh, Allahu Akbar kabira, walhamdulillahi kathira, subhanallahi bukrata na wasila, wajahtu wajhiya, and so on and so forth. And some people will say, uh, so I wanted to know which one was the correct one and the difference. Tayyip, are you done, Muhammad? Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Fawzia from the UK, welcome to the program. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Salah. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I'm doing great. Thank you for asking, Sister Fawziya. Excellent, Brother. Um, I have two questions to ask. Uh, 
first question is uh, um, usually when somebody passes away we say inna lillahi wa inna ilaihi rajiun mm -hmm. so i want you to know uh, if a non muslim passes away can we also say that because the meaning of it is uh, i think it's, it's i don't know if you just let me know and then the second question is that uh, um me and uh, le let's say if there are two women at home me and my mother or my sister and we want to pray together every salah as a jamaat and i lead the jamaat one uh, some quiet ones and some loud ones would it be acceptable i mean for women to do jamaat at home at home every day or whenever we get chance All right. so these are my questions thank you muhammad from new zealand when a person says allahu akbar then you place the right on the left then it is recommended after that and before beginning with the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha to recite something called the opening supplication, Dua ul istiftah And there are many of those supplications. Sometimes you hear somebody saying wajah tu wajhiya, that's valid. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa tabarak asmuka wa ta'ala jadduka wa la ilaha ghayruk, that's valid, prescribed as well. اللهم باعد بيني وبين ذنوبي كما بعدت بين المشرق والمغرب to the end of the supplication قل إن صلاتي ونسكي ومحياي ومماتي all of these supplications have been narrated from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم if you know them all you can recite them all perfectly fine if you know one of them that's fine if you did not recite any the prayer is still valid if you offer it correctly and you're just missing the word of reciting the beginning supplication Sister Fawziya from the UK, when a Muslim dies, we say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. So can we say that whenever a non-Muslim die as well? Yes, of course we should. Because this is not something relating to the dead person. Rather, this is something to acknowledge the fact that all of us, we belong to Allah and unto Him we shall return. Which also indicates it's not particularly at the time of death. The ayah or this supplication was prescribed in Surah Al-Baqarah to say, وَبَشِّرُ الصَّابِرِينَ And give glad tidings to the patient ones. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا those whom whenever they are afflicted with any musiba, any calamity, any affliction, major or minor, they say we all belong to Allah and unto Him we shall return. Ulaika alayhim salawatun min rabbihim wa rahma wa ulaika humul muhtadun. Those who endure calamities patiently and they say, so they say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. The Lord will bless them, will have mercy on them and such people are the rightly guided one. May Allah make us among them. So whenever you're driving and you happen to have a flat tire, oh, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. You were drinking and you dropped the glass and it got broken. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Uh, you're looking for the key, you lost your wallet, you lost your phone, uh, 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 the loss of a loved, a loved one, a loss of money, a sickness, somebody was diagnosed with the, uh, cancer, say, inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'oon. It is to remind yourself and the audience, hey, no matter how major, how huge, how large the calamity is, we all belong to Allah and unto Him one day we shall return, okay? As far as uh, praying in congregation for ladies, if you can do that in every single prayer, <coughs> excuse me, that is very praiseworthy. So if you, your mother and your sister, of you and your daughters at home, and you can attend or you establish jama'ah, you don't need to call iqama. One of you will lead the prayer, will stand in the middle of others, not ahead of the line. And you recite out loud so that they can hear you. All of that is permissible. And the reward for your prayer will be multiplied similar to men 27 times greater. Bismillah.
Well, I won't be able to take any phone calls or questions because we have very short time. And I want to wrap up this hadith. So after the battle of Uhud, a lot of clans and tribes in the peninsula contemplated the idea of hitting Muslims, of injuring Muslims, of harming Muslims, of even assassinating the Prophet ﷺ. So when Banu Nadir attempted to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ, he showed them the red eye and he kicked them out after he besieged them for a couple of weeks. This is, no, uh, this is no joke, this is serious. They even attempted to assassinate the Prophet ﷺ. People from Najd came to uh, hurt Muslims and their intention was not to learn Islam or anything. So they asked the Prophet ﷺ if he can send with us some teachers. So he chose some of the best of the companions, 70 of Al-Ansar. Those companions were known as Al-Qurra, yani the elite. Whenever the Quran is revealed to the Prophet ﷺ, he would recite it upon them. They will learn it, memorize it, ponder over its meaning and then teach it to others. And not like today's Qurra, they live on halwa. You give them some sweet, you, uh, you ask them to recite in a wedding or in a funeral or in a commemoration or in an anniversary. No, no. They were well sufficient, well versed. They recognize that what Allah has given them, that no one else has been given anything similar to it. So people were in need for them, not the other way around. They were not waiting for halwa from people. So they used to work during the day besides learning and teaching Quran for the sake of Allah, not accepting any wages for that. There are some poor people in Medina and the people of as -Suffa, those who were homeless, the Prophet ﷺ shaded some area in the rear of the masjid and he appointed this place for them. You, you guys can stay here. So those who have food will bring it. Those who have uh, you know, a surplus of money will bring it to them. And what they're doing, they are sitting in the masjid, attending the halqa's ta'aleem and learning, but they cannot work. So those qurra would work during the day, would fetch water from the water well, and would fill the pitchers in the masjid. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, أَفْضَلُ الصَّدَقَةِ سَقْيُ الْمَاءِ The best kind of charity is to give water to people. So they comprehended that. So they are educated, they are qurra. They learn, they comprehend, and they teach, and they act upon what they teach. So they were making saqyu uh, al during the day. And then they will go to collect fire logs, and will sell the fire logs. And the money will bring to buy food and clothes for the poor people. MashaAllah, what kind of people are they? They were the best of the best. So the Prophet ﷺ said, but I'm afraid if I send with you those teachers and those qurra, you know, um, they may get hurt because they are not, you know, military personnel. So the person who came, al uh, Bara'a ibn Malik, uh, assured the Prophet I'm their guarantor. I send surety that no one will dare to hurt them. And he was a liar. His intent was actually to assassinate and ambush those 70 Qurra. And they proceeded learning and teaching and working and on the way, they were ambushed by the tribe or the clan of Banu Sulaim before reaching their final destination. Amir ibn Tufayl killed the messenger of the Prophet who invited him to Islam. And then they attacked and they ambushed the remaining 70 Qurra and they killed them all. And while they were being killed, they said, Oh Allah, بلغ عنا رسولا رسولنا بلغ عنا نبينا أنا قد لقينا ربنا فرضينا عنه ورضي عنا. The main concern was to convey the message to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and obviously to the Ummah after that. We're not worried about getting killed or martyred. Rather, we're going into a better place. We just want our brothers, إخواننا, to learn that we are in a better place. We have met with our Lord and we are so pleased with him and he is well pleased with us. So the Almighty Allah conveyed that message to the Prophet ﷺ and he conveyed it to the companions and that is how Anas ibn Malik narrated this hadith. One of those 70 Qurra was uh, Haram, may Allah be pleased with him, who was Anas maternal uncle. So Amr ibn Tufayl incited one of his guys 
to spear him from behind, to poke him from behind. So he pierced them with his spear and it came out of his abdomen. So as I was dying, as, I, as he was dying, he remarked saying, Fuztu wa Rabbi al -Ka Oh my goodness. He said, I'm a winner, I swear to the Lord of the Kaaba. You know, you guys may be little the word, but you don't understand. One word could it change the fate of an ummah. And this is exactly what happened. The person who poked and speared uh, uh, Haram, may Allah be pleased with him, with his spear, his name was Jabbar ibn Salma. When he heard Haram saying, Fustu wa Rabbul Kaaba, I'm a winner, I swear to the Lord of the Kaaba. He was puzzled. What kind of winning are you talking about? You're killed. You're dead. You're betrayed. You're ambushed. You did not even have a chance to defend yourself. So how did you say that? So as a result of hearing that, Jabbar ibn Salma ended up accepting Islam and he became one of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he became a Sahabi. In the hadith, brothers and sisters, an indication to a lot of lessons. One of them is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam when he envoyed those 70 Qurra, you know, he was kind of skeptical. And that's why he said, I'm afraid that they will get hurt. But the guarantor said, I stand surety, I will protect them while he was lying. Oh, how come the Prophet ﷺ didn't know that he is lying? How come the Prophet ﷺ did not predict that they would be ambushed and killed? Well, that's very typical. Because, قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يُوحَى إِلَيَّ أَنَّمَا إِلَهُكُمْ إِلَهُمْ I'm just a human being like you. The difference between you and I, I receive wahi and you don't. And in Surah Al-A'raf, the Almighty Allah revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the ayah قُلْ لَا أَمْلِكُ لِنَفْسِي نَفْعًا وَلَا ضَرًّا إِلَّا مَا شَاءَ اللَّهِ وَلَوْ كُنْتُ أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبَ لَاسْتَكْسَرْتُ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ وَمَا مَسَّنِيَ السُّوءِ إِنْ أَنَا إِلَّا نَذِيرٌ وَبَشِيرٌ لِقَوْمٍ يُؤْمِنُونَ uh, this is ayah number 188 of Surah Al-A'raf. I want all of you brothers and sisters to remember this ayah. The uh, command of Allah to his messenger in this ayah, Say, O Muhammad, I do not possess for myself any benefit nor harm except what Allah wills. And if I've known the unseen Al-Ghayb, I would have increased winning and gaining of every goodness. And no harm would have touched me. But I do not know the unseen. In ana illa nadirun wa bashirun liqawmin yu'minun. So brothers and sisters, the hadith also gives us the bishara that those companions, 70 qurra, who have been ambushed, betrayed, and killed, and martyred, on a battle which is known as bi'ru ma'una, because they were around the water wall of ma'una, which belonged to the clan of Banu Sulaym. They all ended up in paradise. Also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, started making dua for over a month in every prayer of the five daily prayers Fajr, Zuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha in the last rak'ah after rising up from Ruku'ah he started making dua against those treacherers and those perpetrators by name Amr ibn Tufayl and also the tribes of Ri'al the Quan and Adal. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, Allahumma ala kabi, and he named him one after another. As a result, uh, Amr ibn Tufayl was affected by the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu and he was afflicted with a plague and he died as a result of that and he was abandoned by people. And Allah humiliated those who perpetrated and betrayed the seven Qurra. Unfortunately, we ran out of time. We wanted to shed some more light on this interesting hadith. Uh, hopefully, inshallah, in another chance. Until next time, my dear viewers, I leave you all in the care of Allah. I say this, and I thank Allah for you. And I pray for Allah to the Lord Muhammad, and for his family and his family. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Shipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise. We're shipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. Rasulullah. 